Welcome to My Life, Chassidus Applied, episode 368. We're right in the middle of Chedesh El. Today is Yudalad El. Tomorrow will be Tezvov, the 15th of El, the full moon of El. Essentially halfway through this Chedesh HaRachamim, the month of compassion, when Hashem, God, revealed His 13 attributes of compassion, Yud Gimel Midas HaRachamim, to Moshe Rabbeinu, and that's what radiates every month of El. Right now, that special energy. The Moshe, an example of the Alter Rebbe, to understand it, the Melech is Besod. That the Melech and his compassion and Rachamim are radiating, radiating now, not just when we are in the palace during holidays or on Shabbos, but in the very weekdays, the mundane activities we're involved in, the field activities, when we're hard at work, the Melech is greeting us with a smiling face and you can approach him easily without formalities and ask for anything you wish. What greater gift, especially as we are preparing for the new year and we are taking, accounting for the past year. So that's Chodesh El. Ani li, I am to my beloved, my beloved is to me. We take the initiative, we reach out to our beloved God and God responds. And this will, of course, lead us into the high holiday season. And the better we prepare, the better we experience those se- that season, which means hachana. When you do something, when you write the right, create the right containers and you prepare yourself, then the blessings have somewhere to reside. Now, obviously, Hashem blesses us regardless. But the more work we put in, the more preparation, the more likely that the blessings manifest and are sustainable. So we wish each other k'siva v'chsimateva during this month of Elul. We'll do so both in the beginning of the program and at the conclusion of the program because this is the time where we are fully immersed in this process. Every day is another day in Elul, another day of preparation, another day of accountability. This week also specifically has special days within Elul itself. We'll begin with the 15th of Elul. Is, this is the 120 fourth anniversary, Tafresh Nun Zayin, from when the Rebbe Rashab established Yeshiva's Temchet Mimin. On Tezvavel, Tafresh Nun Zayin. This week will also be Chayel. Chayel is the birthday of the Shnei Me'eris Hagdelim, the two great luminaries, the Baal Shem Tov, in the year Kohos, Tov Kuf Hei, and the Alter Rebbe, in the year, I should, I should reverse that, the Alter Rebbe in the year Tov Kuf Hei, and, and the Baal Shem Tov in the year Nachas Tov Nun Ches. So we are also honoring and celebrating the, the birthday of these two great luminaries, the founder of Chassidus Aklolis, the Baal Shem Tov, and the founder of Chassidus Chabad, the Alter Rebbe. It's also Parsha Kisove, and, uh, which we'll read next Shabbos, but the whole week is called Parsha Kisove. So we'll talk about the Chassidus applied to all these items but it's always good to begin with Elul, which I just said, Elul has a special energy. Every time, every month has its unique energy. This is the energy of compassion, of Yud Gimel Midas Harachim, of Melech Basada, with the opportunity to correct, repair, improve, and above all, to be prayer, prepare ourselves to receive even greater blessings in all matters of our lives. And we sure could use these blessings especially during these difficult times, challenges that we've gone through with COVID and other tragedies in this past year, that it should be a year of only simchas and the ultimate simcha, the simcha of the gula hamitis vashlemo. <clears throat> I should also mention, our hearts go out, that horrible murder of a Jewish person in a school in Colorado, just testifying to the fact that we still have a cheshach to deal with and there's still work to be done in preparing the world and the people in the world toward the, what the, the Sheva Mitzvah's B'nai Neach, the universal code of morality and ethics that everyone needs to abide by in order for there to be the healthiest possible life and healthiest possible world in which we live. At the same time, the Rebbe made it very clear that we are on the threshold of the Geula, yet we need to open our eyes and do whatever it takes to help other people become conscious and aware of this energy and above all, implementing it in our personal lives. So Elul is an excellent time to achieve this because it's the end of the year. 
It's like a conclusion and a preparation for a new year, which we all pray and hope for to be a year of complete pedus, uh, in a way that will be revealed in the way of real geula for each human being and all human beings on this earth. So we'll begin with um, Chayel, then I'll move to Tezvavel. Even though Tezvavel comes first, but Chayel seems to be because it's the Yemel of the Alter Reb and the Baal Shem Tev. In many ways, this was the reason that the Reb Rashab chose this month to establish the yeshiva. So we can go in any order. This is not a statement of priority. It's rather just making a decision. I have many more questions about Chayel. But then we'll move to over to, to Tezvavel and then to Pasha Kisove. So what can we learn from this day? So we know Elul is filled with all kinds of lessons. The pri- one of the prim- primary ones is Ani Ludei Dividei Dili, which refers to the real Aveda of our reaching to God and God responding to us. So the, in the Sikhs of the Friedrich Rebbe, different expressions about Chayel, that Chay El bringt in Chay is 18, Chay represents Chay So in El itself, it brings a vitality, a certain dynamic element. Now, why is that the case? Because it's the birthday of the Shnei Ma'eris Hagdelim, the two great luminaries, which is the verse from, the, from Chumash, what's happened on Wednesday, and that was when those birthdays took place, of those that established the Baal Shem Tov and the al Rebbe, which what did Chassidus come to do? To bring Chayis into Yiddishkeit. Chayis into Teira, Aveda, Gmilz, Chasodim, Tshuva, and Geula, the five different acronyms that we find in the word El. So Chayis means... A primis anashami, you can do things by rote, mechanically, what's called mitzvah sanashim ulamada, more like robotic or mechanical Judaism. Many people can also prepare for Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. It's part of our habit, part of our rituals. Better than nothing. Or you can do it with an inner dynamic passion, an excitement, and vitality. That's what Chassidus comes to introduce, to teach us what does it mean, the Yud Gimel Midas Arachamim, Melech Basada, how to personalize it in our personal lives and how to make it something that is very part and parcel of something we do with a, not just mechanically and just, not just to be Yetzir, but in the fullest sense of the word. But for that, you need to understand what is El. That's why the Mela Basada example, the king in the field is so powerful. It makes it relevant, it makes it personal to understand that here's a month that, that God is telling us, I am near you, I'm close to you, God is always close to us, but with less layers, we have more access. With less effort, we can achieve so much more. So when you think of it that way, that this is an opportunity, once in a year opportunity, to review everything you've done and to prepare, then it takes on a whole different meaning. It's like if you're going to a Lahavdala meeting or to make a presentation, you're going to prepare properly because it's significant, it has consequences. Here too, Understanding that our relationship with God, as Chassidus explains, by the Baal Shem Tev and the Alta Rebbe, and their, and their successors, the Magid and the Alta Rebbe, the Mitla Rebbe, the Samach Tzedek, the Rebbe Marash, the Rebbe Rashab, the Rebbe Nishmer Seydin, the Fritik Rebbe, and the Rebbe, what do they come to explain? That a relationship with God is not just a mechanical thing. A relationship with God is the most important thing in our lives because it defines the very mission for which we were sent to this world to understand that we are indispensable creatures, we are indispensable ambassadors that God put on this earth to achieve something, to turn the world, the corner of the world that we have connection with, into a divine home. And when you do so, not only are you fulfilling what God wants, you're fulfilling your very calling, your very essence, your very raison d'etre, your very purpose. So it's the healthiest way of living. When you learn chassidus, you appreciate this. So it's not just following obligations and, and commandments. We're connections. Mitzvahs is also from the word connections. And the month of El, the example used, is Kiruv Hamoyer al A soul comes down to this earth. On its own, it doesn't necessarily always feel its divine source. But like an orbit, as it comes closer to Rosh Hashanah, and Yom Kippur, called the Kiruv Hamoyer al where the source of the flame, the mother flame, and the, each individual soul gets closer to each other. The ultimate is going to be in Yom Kippur. But like every orbit, it takes time till you get there. 
Rosh Hashanah is and it's associated with That's why it says, kor, 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 it says, Karuo Dish Hashem be Motze, Karuo be Yesi Karuv. Appeal to God, beseech God when He is found. Karuo called out to Him when He's close. What does close mean? So the Mitla Rebbe and Chassidus explains, Kiruv Hamoyer Al Anutzutz. Now God is always close to us, but we don't feel it. But when there's this period of time, when the soul and the mother's so-called flame come closer, you see a flame starts being inclined to absorb. It's connected. When you put two flames together, you see suddenly how they reach out to each other. So we feel in our consciousness, in our psyche, we feel that if we allow ourselves to. Just one explanation of many of Chassidus, how Chassidus explains this period in time. So it brings a chayis into El. A passion, a, a do it with passion, with a dynamic element and a vitality, a primius, warmth. And when you're passionate about something, generally speaking, you're much more committed to it. You know, we, have, we live in a world where there are much competition. There are many different forces, many different temptations that, are, that attract us and are tempting us all the time, seducing us even. So we need to find deeper ways to connect ourselves, our children, our families, anyone we can come in contact with, to the importance of this time. So imagine see, seeing this period in time and a and way to reconnect, to revisit and renew your contract with the very mission of your life, which will begin with Rosh Hashanah, the renewal, the birthday of the human race and the birthday of every individual. Chayis and El. So it gives us a chayis, a passion. That's one way of explaining it. As I said, there are many ways to explain it. But it's one example of what Chayel does. Now, the difference between the Baal Shem Tov and the, and the Alter Rebbe is they're both Chassidus, but uh, as we know, they were taught that the Baal Shem Tov taught that every person can serve God. And the Alter Rebbe taught how everyone can serve God. Friedrich Rebbe gives an example of a ladder. The Baal Shem Tov provided, the Baal Shem Tov taught, taught us, that the Baal Shem Tov provided with us a ladder that everyone can climb on this ladder, and the Alter Rebbe taught us how to climb the ladder. Chassidus Chabad is a comprehensive blueprint, step by step, of how you can connect to your deeper source and your deeper essence, living up to your greatest potential. And that is not just survival and biological living and just making a living, making money and being happy in the physical sense of the word. It's living up to your higher calling, your transcendent purpose in this world. Which when a person does that, they're fulfilling their very purpose and that's something that is eternal and immortal forever. Okay. So there are a bunch of questions that came in about Chayel. So I will go through them one by one. Is it significant that the Baal Shem Tov was born in Elul? And then this writer writes as follows. Is it significant that the Baal Shem Tov was born in the month of El and the revolution of Judaism he introduced in which even simple people could achieve ecstatic spiritual experiences and have a connection with God by doing mitzvahs can have similarities to our service in Elul when the king is in the field and even simple people can walk up to the king without an appointment and have a connection with the king. Okay, good point. I have not seen that explicitly, but I'm sure it says, very likely it says it somewhere, that Abbasichus, but regardless, it's a good point because Mel Abbasad is exactly that that you don't need to have the formalities and all the preparations that one would need to go into the palace. Then the Chedeshel, the Melech Basada, in the field, as you are, dressed in your work garments, which doesn't just mean physical garments, but also your work involvements, as you're involved in the pedestrian matters of life and survival, you have access. That's exactly what the Baal Shem Tov taught, that every person has that neshama, the etzema neshama, and the Baal Shem Tov revealed it, that's why it's called Yisrael, one of the reasons, because you saw when you call someone by name, even if they're fainted or in some comatose state, it wakens them up. The Jewish people were going through a pretty comatose state in general terms during that period. It was the beginning of many new challenges that were coming into play. It was a world where there was distinctions among the Jewish community as well, hierarchies that took over. And the simple Jew, the simplicity and innocence of Amun Pshuta was somewhat not appreciated. And the Baal Shem Tov revealed that every person has that connection. It was always known, but he interturned it into a whole system called Chassidus and bringing that alive in a personal way. And so that has a lot of similarity to, to the month of El. That's a good point, point well taken. Okay. 
What was the what was the main teachings of the Baal Shem Tev, and why did they why did he have so much opposition? So it's hard to sum it all up here in a short program like this, but I will say a few points. Generally speaking, the main teachings of the Baal Shem Tev are categorized by the Rabbeim as follows, and not not any particular order, but this is Avis Yisrael. Even though it's a pasuk v'haftarecha kamecha, but the key is to emphasize how to do it. And that is through appreciating the neshama ve'id. So when you don't look at the soul, so you could have people you like, people you like less. But when you understand the neshama, as the Alter Rebbe explains, also the Baal Yem of Chayel, in Tanya chapter Lev, chapter Love, Pedic Lamed Beis, explains that when you contemplate on the neshama of a person, and, we, and you look at, and look at nafshe ike v'gufei tofel, that the nefesh is primary, and the body is secondary, which means spirit comes first and matter second, that's how you come to true love. That was first teaching. Another one that every Aviv will serve us with joy, with unbridled simcha. Again, it's a mitzvah in the Teda, but the Baal Shem Tov seeing the need for it, and simcha comes also from experiencing the neshama. The third thing, the, the, the Shavas B'chor that God... As the Alter Rebbe explains in the beginning of Shai Yechud Vamunu, Peter Shabal Shem Tov, Le'elam Hashem Tvarcha, Nitzu B'Shamayim, that every second God renews existence. So we have like a renewed relationship with God every moment, and nothing is old hat, it's constant vitality. Which leads to Ashgach HaPratis, everything is a divine providence, even a leaf turning over in the wind. And finally, that everything we see in here is a lesson of Eidus Hashem. The Baal Shem Tov taught a lot more than that. But those are the, some of the primary teachings of the Baal Shem Tov. The opposition, well, but, but physically speaking, historically speaking, this was in the wake of after Shabtai Tzvi, and there was a lot of suspicion about any type of spiritual or mystical approach to Judaism. Is it accurate? Is it not accurate? So as a limut schus, many were, were, many were wary until they met the Baal Shem Tov. They met his Talmidim. And when you see who the Talmidim were, they were not. They were the greatest scholars of the time. But there was still weariness, which can be understood. With time, once you saw that the chassidim, not only did not, God forbid, abrogate or in any way compromise Yiddishkeit, but enhanced it, much more commitment, much more passion, then it became clear. But that was the general opposition. In Ruchnius, the reason is given, which is why the Alter Rebbe was ultimately arrested, because Lamaila, there was still a question. You know, once you start revealing the inner secrets of Teda, it has a lot of power. And there was always a Sacha Kenegad, the other side, that challenges it. And finally, when the Alter Rebbe came out of prison, we know he was vindicated, and therefore, and then it was blessed from above, and endorsed that this is the new approach, the right approach. When I say new, not a new Teir Chaz Shalom. It's Panimiya Sateir. But now that it could be spread everywhere, where once upon a time it was only reserved for the few, the select few, but with beginning with the Arizal, mitzvah legal is And then the subsequent generations, the Baal Shem Tev, when he heard from Mashiach, Yufutsu Manesach and Chutzah will bring the Geula, will bring Mashiach. And the Alter Rebbe, as the Rebbe Rashab says, that with Yutas Kislev began, a new Tkufa, the beginning, the primary Yufutsu Manesach and Chutzah, this now became the force that in many ways saved Yiddishkeit. Because Yiddishkeit, without that Primia Satera, at least by the masses, was rendered, was beginning to be rendered as very technical, very robotic. The world was changing. It was no longer living in a secluded and insulated environment. So all the winds around that were challenging became very powerful attractions. The only, pre, the only thing that could prevent was the proactive chassidus that would teach you that chassidus and teda has all the answers you know. You don't need to go to other cultures or to other systems. Mitzvahs alone, obviously, are divine mitzvahs, but if you don't have the neshama, neshama beleg, a guf beleg neshama, it can lose vitality and lose relevance. And hence, Chassidus, starting the Baal Shem Tev and the Magid, the Alter Rebbe, coming in Tanya to explain that what? Eichu korav ma'id, korav elecha dover ma'id, b'fichu b'lvav say, how? How is it relevant? How is it close? How is it personal? How is it accessible? and applicable to our personal and emotional and every aspect of our lives. Okay. If, next question. 
Is there a similarity between the Baal Shem Tov's teachings that all Jews are equal in the eyes of God and the challenge to the hierarchies? Is there a similarity between that to La Havdal, the elimination of class distinctions in socialism? Or someone else wrote the Dilva differently. Is, is the Baal Shem Tov's message was that everyone has a job to do and anyone who does a mitzvah has an equal connection to God regardless of their status in society, would that seem like a form of socialism? Well, it's a good lahavdil because socialism has nothing to do with godly and divine. And frankly, and the other way around as well, you could say Kairach Steiner was more socialistic when he said, Madu'a disnasu and kola edik deshimheim. And he was incorrect in that. There is a hierarchy. Abba Shemtev didn't come to destroy a hierarchy of Tamid Chachamim and Rosh Yeshivas and Abonim and Torah authorities. He came to understand that Judaism is not just based on academic excellence. There's a need for that. But every neshama, every Jew has a neshama that's beating deeply inside, no matter what his status is. And people shouldn't look down at each other because of that. This is not about taking away, eliminating the qualities that are necessary when you turn to a teacher, when you turn to a mentor, to a rav, to a, to a uh, mashpia. And to a rebbe, chesidus has a rebbe. So a Rebbe is a form of hierarchy, a good hierarchy, eliminating any negative hierarchy or bureaucracy. So that's the answer. Is there something you can find similarity that the idea that there shouldn't be class distinctions and, that, and the discrimination and the abuse and alienation that results from it? There's always a positive thing, as the Friedrich Rebbe said when he was asked about what's the Teda view on socialism and capitalism. He said the Teda is the best of all worlds. So of course there's things to be learned from it. But it's, I wouldn't put it in the same equation or in the same sentence. Okay. Actually, I wrote it once a, a series of, uh, it's a series of, uh, it's actually a paper that I delivered in Cambridge University. You can look it up on MeaningfulLife.com, Money and Spirituality, discussing a lot about Judaism's approach, socialism versus capitalism, and how Taylor looks at these systems and of course, addressing the issue of what the Baal Shem Tov came to introduce. Next question. Achia Hashileni, Achio Hashileni. Who was Achia Hashileni, the teacher of the Baal Shem Tov? What connection did he have with being the Baal Shem Tov's teacher? We're told that the, he was a teacher of the Baal Shem Tov. Now, Achia Hashileni is first mentioned in Tanakh as a novi, as a prophet in the time of Shlema HaMelech. Some Adrashim is to bring that he was Baruchnis at least in the time of Moshe Rabbeinu. So, so actually, the Rebbe touches upon this, more than touches upon it. There's a Sikha from the Rebbe in a footnote. I'm looking right now at Lakute Sikhis, volume uh, two. Sikha of Yud Shvat. Um, it's Yud Shvat, it's from Fayakal Pukude Heitov Shin Yud. And the Rebbe writes there about the Baal Shem Tov and his teacher, the Baal Chai. Chai Roshetev is Chai Yechida. The Rebbe says Roshetev is Chai Yechida, and this means Achia Hashaleni. He cites a sicha from the Rebbe, from the Friedrich Rebbe. It's on page five twelve in the Kute Sichas, volume two, and the Rebbe says in the Laisata till now, I did not find anywhere an explanation of the connection between the Baal Shem Tov and Achia Hashaleni. The Dafke he, specifically he, was the Baal Shem Tov's teacher, but then the Rebbe goes on. That the Rajbi said, and Rajbi, of course, was the father of Primi Satera, that he could, he could free the world, redeem the world from all matters, all severities and judgments till Mashiach comes, if Achia Shalani will join him. The Rebbe brings sources. And the Rebbe explains, Yesh Levai, you can explain this according to the Arizal, who says Rajbi was a Gilgal, a reincarnation of Achia Shalani. And since it says in Zayr that till Mashiach comes, that how will we be redeemed through this Sefer, Sifra Diloch Zayar? That's the connection. And therefore, the Rebbe says, Im Kain, that's the connection to the Baal Shem Tov, because the Baal Shem Tov's Inyan, his all purpose was, Yefutsa Maynesecha Chutza. That's when Mashiach will come, as Mashiach told him. As the Baal Shem Tov writes in his famous letter to his brother in law. Then the Rebbe continues, he brings from Teldus Yaakov Yasef that Achia Shalani received from Moshe Rabbeinu. And he was from those that left Egypt. 
And then he was from the from Bezdin of David HaMelech, and he was a teacher of Eliyahu And here the Rebbe again explains. And a teacher of the Baal Shem Tev. He also brings the tale of Yaakov Yesuf. So from this says the Rebbe, Mashmik Tzas, it appears somewhat that the fact that he was the teacher of the Baal Shem Tev, Achia Shaleni, we're talking about, has a connection to being the teacher of Elio, Hanovi, and, and we can understand it because Elio Hanovi is the person who prepares and makes the announcement for, for, and prepares the ground for Mashiach's coming. So all this the Rebbe is using to comp- explain the connection. In addition, Aliyah Novi, how does he prepare for Mashiach's coming? By creating Ava. Ava, Ava Sisro, and Ava Sisro. Which says that he will, the Heshev Leva of Salbonim, and he will create. And that's also from the Nyanim of the Baal Shem Tov, Ava Sisro. The Rebbe writes, Afila Aza, even a Jew that found somewhere Bekatsvi Tevel, somewhere in the farthest outskirts of the world. And even the simplest Jews. Then the Rebbe continues, one more point he makes. Why dafke him? Why dafke achia shaleni from all the teachers? She says maybe you can say because achia shaleni prophesized about the, the divisiveness that will be by the Jewish people when there will be the division between the two malchus, the two kingdoms, malchus Yisrael, malchus Yehuda, and this was the cause for the Golas. And what's the tikkun for it? Yichsidis, Primi Sater, the Baal Shem Tov teaches, Mashiach comes, that no longer there'll be these two kingdoms, but there'll be unity. Avdi David, Melech Aleyah. Then the Rebbe goes on to explain also the connection to Chai Yechida, because Chsidis is Chai Yechida of Primi Sater. So there you have some of the Rebbe's thoughts on this concept. Next question. Hidden Sadiqim. We know that Baal Shemta was one of the hidden Sadiqim. Why were there groups of hidden Sadiqim in the first place? Isn't it rude to have a talent for great Torah learning and teaching, but instead you live in a shack in the forest? It's completely isolated and completely separated from everyone else. Imagine if 36 great doctors who knew this cures for terrible illnesses decided not to go to the hospitals to help people, but instead formed a group, a secret group called the Hidden Doctors, that stayed in a forest and did their own meditations, would that be ex- appropriate? Okay, very practical question. And the general answer is, the Lamed Vav Tzadikim, that we usually talk about 36 Tzadikim, or the Tzadik Yusei Deilam, are here for a few reasons. First of all, you need to have Tzadikim, they hold up the world, because spiritually speaking, the world was created for a purpose. So even if everybody else is not living up to their destiny, to their calling, you have these tzaddikim that hold up. So number one, we all benefit from that, whether we know it or not. Number two, why is something concealed? Why was Moshe till 80 years old? Why didn't Hashem send him earlier? Because there's something about a concealed level, as Chassidus explains, that either prepares that tzaddik, or the gilu is still too great to be revealed. The world is not ready. Until age 36, that was the case with the Baal Shem Tov. So it was, God forbid, it was depriving. These tzaddikim the started would travel from town to town. You read in Sefer Zechrenis, in the memoirs of the Fidi Rebbe, what kind of things they did to save communities, and they sometimes did expose themselves, sometimes they didn't. So there's something about unsung heroes, if you wish, that are behind the scenes. You don't really see their revealed effect, but their effect is there. So it was not about depriving, God forbid, and just staying in a forest or just meditating. Yes, they spent many years working on themselves. But then came the day when the Baal Shem Tov was revealed. And it wasn't like till then he didn't accomplish anything, God forbid. He was a teacher. He not a teacher, he was an assistant to a teacher who would walk the children to school. Some say that that may have been his greatest accomplishment in a way. Because no one knew who he was, and he would ask the children to make brachas, have Jews come and say, Baruch Hashem. He was revealing a lakus. Now, obviously, it took on a whole different dimension later. But to say, God forbid, that he was then just a private citizen, so to speak, and just taking care of himself, no. God's, God's mysterious ways are God's ways, and everything has its time and everything has its purpose. So then when he was revealed, he obviously brought all the giluim of the, the nistad in there. So the idea that Chassidus talks about their dargis like chokh mistimah, 
the agas that are called concealed levels, they're concealed not because they're avoiding revelation. They defy revelation. They're higher than revelation. Like we're talking about Moshe Rabbeinu. He came from Alma Discasia, concealed worlds. That's why he didn't have a, that's why he couldn't speak clearly. Because Dibur is Alma Disgalia. Minamaya Mishisihu. Moshe was drawn from water. Water is a concealed world. But then the Abishta ones that that concealed higher states should become revealed. So Moshe became that bridge. And the same is true with the Balshemtav and every other tzaddik in that form. And everything has its time and in its place. Okay. Are all those Balshemtav legends and stories true? Or they fabricated in order to try to inspire the community and prop up the Baal Shem Tov from a small shtetl rabbi into a major world leader. Now, I don't like the disrespectful tone, but I'm reading it because I always try to read what people say and that people think this way. But I want to make clearly protest that's not the way to speak about the Baal Shem Tov. After all, didn't the Tzemach Tzedek say, if you believe the Baal Shem Tov stories, you're a fool, and if you don't believe them, you're an apicatus. So are we fools or apicurs? Well, if you think about the statement, I don't know if the Tzemach Tzaddik said it, but whoever said it, what is the statement saying? Yeah, that all legends, that just because someone said them doesn't mean they're all true. But to say that they're not is equally problematic. So no, we're not apocryphs and we're not fools. We're wise people. When you hear something with a source from a Rebbe, who heard it from a Rebbe of his, so unreliable, it's a true story. If it's just hearsay and you don't find a source in the Rabbeim, then, then it could be a legend. Can there be a lesson from it? Like Sometimes the Rebbe would say in a Fabrengen, I didn't hear the story from Shver, from my father-in-law, but still it's a Geshmaka story, it's, enjoy, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice story, a story you can learn things from. So it's very important to be accurate because we need sources, we don't make things up. Have legends been made up? I mean, clearly from this statement, there have been. Can you learn lessons? Yes, but it's just not the same as an accurate true story. So I think in this context, we have to find the right authorities, like anything. Something that if someone just says hearsay, the Torah needs a mocker for everything. If it's a mocker, this is true also the stories in Medrash. Just because some stories sound fantastic, if it's a story with a source, it's with a source. If someone just said there was no source that the sea parted after the Jews left Egypt, that's not legitimate enough. Could God make part the sea? Of course he could. So in concept he could. How do we know it happened? Because the Torah says so. And the same thing we apply to the Baal Shem Tov in this context. Okay. The next question. A lot of questions about the Baal Shem Tov. Did the Baal Shem Tov elimin- eliminate demons? Or we call Shadim. Do demons still exist or did the Baal Shem Tov banish them to the forest? And if so, is it safe to go camping? Or can Ashmedai get you and eat you up? Okay, very cute. Um, well, yes, it does say, Sefer Zechrenis, he brings it, that the Baal Shem Tov once and for all eliminated demons from this earth. As a matter of fact, I might as well share the Vusa de Milson, an interesting uh, 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 story. It was in the year Tov Shemem Gimel, when the Rebbe spoke about, Tov Shemem Dal, let me correct myself, Tov Shemem Dalad. 1984, Shabbos Pasha Mishpotim and Truma, the Rebbe spoke then a lot about uh, Tanya being read, learned on the radio. And the, one of the points was that radio is not created by human beings. When I say not radio itself, the Koyach Adir, the enormous power of technology, is not created by human beings. So those that had complaints and said that how could you use radio or television or other technologies when there's also bad things on there? So the point that Rebbe said, that's because of this free will. Just like gold can be used, for, unfortunately, for bad things, but gold was created to use it for the Mishkan. Rebbe wrote then a whole piece in his own handwriting. So one of the things that Rebbe brought was a statement that nothing creates itself. God is the creator of everything, including te- the, the, the technologies. We're not talking about the actual machines that tap into technology. The very technologies that give us that ability and power to communicate, to reach, to transcend time and space, as the Rebbe explains there. So in the discussion, there was a discussion there about what about in the Gemara you find that certain demons were able to create. And the Rebbe addresses there that whole topic. 
And part of what the Rebbe said in Truma Mem Gimel, he said that it's known that after the Rambam, there are no more demons, no more shading. So we asked the question to the Rebbe, I had the schools to work, where does it say such a thing? Not that we question the Rebbe's statement, but is there a source? We know the Baal Shem Tov eliminated Shadim. The Baal Shem Tov was many years after the Rambam. So our thinking was, and this we wrote to the Rebbe, that because the Rambam writes that Shadim is a completely nonsense, so the Rebbe, in order to so-called reconcile the Rambam with other sources that do talk about demons, said that after the Rambam, from the Rambam on, there were no more Shadim. That's why the Rambam so-called dismissed it. And the Rebbe accepted that. As much as possible, you try to avoid machlekes, meaning disagreements. So before the Rambam, there's a disagreement. The Rambam maybe would say there weren't. That, that, that there weren't. But after the Rambam says that, there's no disagreement because at that time, the thing, there were no more demons. Regarding the Baal Shem Tov, the Rebbe never really responded in detail, but clearly does say that. Bottom line is, practically speaking, you can go camping, be at peace, do things l'shem shamayim, everything should be done for good holy purposes, and God will protect you. And we do not, we're not concerned about today about demons. Whether it's the time of the Baal Shem Tov or the time of the Rambam, that period is gone. Those keiches hatuma don't exist no longer on this earth in the way that once did exist. Okay. What's the story with the Maral and the Golem and the Friedrich Rebbe is visiting the Shul in Prague to see the Golem's remains? Chayel is the Yotze of the Maral, correct, who is famous for creating a Golem to protect the community from anti-Semitic attacks. Can you relate the story where the Friedrich Rebbe writes that when he was a teenager traveling through Prague, he snuck into the attic of the shul and saw the corpse of the golem laying sideways under a pile of Seamus and it terrified him. And somehow his father found out and rebuked him for going up there. Why would the Friedrich Rebbe be afraid of something that was created to help and protect the community? And why would he be rebuked for looking at and celebrating something positive that helped protect the community? So I actually addressed this in episode 189, more detail. So I refer you to there. The Rebbe makes it very clear that, yes, the Friedrich Rebbe said this. The Friedrich Rebbe says, I heard it myself from Schwer, from my father-in-law. I don't think he was a teenager. I think that he was, he was uh, older than that, if I recall correctly. But there's a story because this was a place that was not meant to be visited. Maral, they say, or others made a takona that no one should ever go see there because when you use Shemes Gdeshim, holy names, what the Maral did, then after that's finished with, this becomes like off limits, just like somebody who's buried under the ground. You don't dig up, God forbid. And when the Friedrich Rebbe, for whatever reason he did it, the Rebbe Rashab did, did not happy with it. Why the Friedrich Rebbe went, I don't know. I don't know if it says anywhere. It wasn't just curiosity. He's a, the Rebbe is a Rebbe. He wasn't a Rebbe yet, but he was a Rebbe. He became a Rebbe, a son of a Rebbe. He had his reasons. And we don't know necessarily the, what those reasons were. So that, go to episode 189, where I discuss it more at length. And finally, regarding the Baal Shem Tov, one, one Ashluchim, fulfilling Mashiach's words to the Baal Shem Tov. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, was the sending of thousands of Shluchim around the world the fulfillment of Mashiach telling the Baal Shem Tov that Mashiach will come after the wellsprings are spread out? And so, why hasn't he come yet? So, absolutely. The Rebbe said this many, many times. Yafutsa Manasech HaChutsa became the, the theme, the statement declared by the Rabbeim that Mashiach told the Baal Shem Tov when he asked the question, when the Mashiach, when Baal Shem Tov went up, Rosh Hashanah, Tovku Vizayin, and he went up to, and met in the Hechel of the chamber of Mashiach, and he asked him, when will you come? And he said, when your wellsprings, kishifutsu menesecha chutza, will spread outward. And then these three words have been expressed by all the rabbeim as being essentially the essence of what Chassidus is coming to accomplish, to bring the geula. So this, of course, includes the sending of the shluchim to go chutza, chutza shein chutza memeno, to every place possible in the world, and bring teira and chassidus, and prepare the world for the geula. Now, why does it prepare the world for the geula? Because Chassidus is Pnimi Satera, which will be learned when Mashiach comes. It talks about godliness. So what way do you prepare better to make a godly world, a divine world, is through Maseinu Bavid and specifically 
Pnimis HaTeda, learning, discussing, analyzing, and applying Chassidus to our personal lives. That prepares the, the, the world for Gula. Not as a Zgula. You do this, like tit for tat. It's actually cause and effect. The more Primis HaTeda we learn, the more we learn about what godliness is about, the more we learn about what Mashiach is about, the more we become Mashiach de conscious, Mashiach conscious, and living up to the life, what will be when Mashiach comes, that the world will be filled with divine knowledge as the waters cover the sea. Divine knowledge. The words of the Rambam. That the entire business of the world would be nothing but to know godliness. And many, many such expressions in the prophets, in the Shaya and other places. Chapter 36 and 37 in Tanya, the Al-Tareb elaborates what Mashiach's world will look like. So primis atayda, learning chassidus, is exactly what that's supposed to do. So every shliach and every one of us doing that work is fulfilling the message and the mission that Mashiach told the Baal Shem Tev, that when your wellsprings will be spread outward, and outward means not just physically, it also means spiritually and psychologically and emotionally, that will permeate every type of person. And in many ways, the whole chassidus applied of this program is driven by that as well. So yes, why it hasn't happened yet? That's the big million dollar question. Why after 26, 7 years from Gimel Tammuz and 30 years from Chav Chesivan, clearly we have to still do something that we haven't done. So as I always focus on, we don't ask why it didn't happen. We ask, what are we going to do to make it happen? That's our challenge and that's our question and that's what we're committed to. Okay. So let's move now to Tezvav which is tonight, tomorrow, the 15th of Elul, the day when the Shiva's Tem Chetuim was established. So first let's just spell that out, what that means, the significance of that, is that the, the Rebbe Rashab established a Tem Chetuim, the Rabbein before him did not, in a Sikha, among many Sikhas, in a Sikha, I believe it was Simchas Teir, Tafresh Pei Vov, Friedrich Rebbe says, that when my father, Needed, found, found the Temchit Mimim in the year Tafresh Nun Zayin, that is 1897. It's already 10 years that I've been thinking about this, and I givalgitzach, I meant he meant that he, he, uh, he wandered, he uh, hung around. That would be the Samach Tzedek and the Reb Marash. And I was going to the oil time and again until it became a fact, and that's when he established it within the Sheva Brachas of the Friedrich Rebbe's marriage that year, Tafresh Nuzayin, as we discussed last week. Yesterday was Gyud Gimelel, the anniversary of the Friedrich Rebbe's marriage, 124th, and two days later was the establishment of Tem Chetmim, and Chayel was the first day that it opened up for... Uh, for business, so to speak. And he also explains what was the purpose. So the Rebbe Friedrich Rebbe says here, there are Gdalim, there are great people that, that established yeshivas learning Teda. Without a Tata Nazeda, referring to this story, without their father and grandfather. So what was, like, what was so significant? Why did he have to take 10 years thinking about it? Valgrenzich. Valgrenzich means discussing it and back and forth. And, and the Tatad Gizokt, he says, as a nit gemach temchet mim, if magdal zayn limedatel. My father said they didn't establish the yeshiva just from learning Teira alone, even though that's a great thing. Teira hot nit gefeld by Eden. Teira was not missing by the Jews. So there were yeshivas. That those that learn Teda should be Anoshim, mentioned. A full body, full, fully committed to. And he brings in the footnote, they bring from Kuntr Seitzachayim, which is the mission statement that Rebbe Rashab wrote, what was the purpose of this yeshiva. So he said there was not Lahagdil Laharchiv Esika Teda and Niglis, it was not just to expand and grow learning Teda. 
but that the Bochrim in the yeshiva should be Yehudim, Eden, Yereim Veshlemim in Hashem Veterose. Complete in their awe and the Yerushamayim. So in other words, it was more than just learning because you can learn and not necessarily be completely, passionately committed to godliness. And the sikha that he said, that Rebbe Rashab said in Tovshin Beis, Simchas the famous Kol HaYetzel and Mochamez Beis David, he identified the students in the yeshiva, Tamimim, as those that would be soldiers to fight the spiritual war. And he makes it clear, spiritual war. Not B'Koyach V'Olei B'Chayel, but B'Ruchi. Not with strength and not with, 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 an, with an army. He says that's Musad and, and rebuke and Teichacha. A negative approach of criticizing, of attacking. But Baruchi with spirit, the spirit of Chassidus and Primi Satena. In simple words, he created, the school was to create, the yeshiva was to create Timimim. Timimim means complete ones. And that was the name that Rebbe Rashab gave. Temechet Mimim, which we say in Simchas Teira. Temechet Mimim. The support of Tmimim. To be soldiers that would deal with the challenges of assimilation, as he explains there. Assimilation both in the sense of people who don't really see and don't understand the relevance of Yiddishkeit to their lives, and also assimilation even of those that are committed but are lacking the connection to godliness, to Lekus, and to Mashiach. So this was the purpose of Tem Chetmim. So when we honor the 124th anniversary, we're honoring what was established, which really is the training camp of every shliach and every shlucha, because it also includes ultimately the men and the women who were trained by the rabbeim, starting from the Rebbe Rashab in that yeshiva, as was established then, and then the continuation of the yeshiva and all its different names, as it broadened and expanded by the Friedrich Rebbe and then by the Rebbe who tapped into this yeshiva for, what, the soldiers of our time. So it's more than just learning Torah. It's understanding that you need to be a proactive leader in communities, to go all over the world and find Jews who unfortunately are either assimilated or tinik shenishba, don't know better, and to teach them Yiddishkeit and chassidus. So tem mimim was a new thing. Why the Rabbein before didn't do it? We don't have a black and white answer. But most likely, based on what you see all of this, is because the challenges that were coming needed, required a whole new training camp, for lack of a better word. The previous generation didn't have that assimilation, didn't have all those challenges that he describes. The charfu, Rivecha Hashem, charfu ikvis meshichecha. The two generations where he discusses in that sikh and tafshin beis which incidentally is a year right after the Rebbe was born. And not, one second, not a year after. Let me correct myself. The Sikh was Tavshin Aleph, a year before the Rebbe was born in Tavshin, in, in, uh, in the, the Sikh was Tafre Samach Aleph, a year before the Rebbe was born in Tafre Samach Beis. I mentioned Tavshin Beis because in Sefer HaSikh is Tavshin Beis is where the Sikh is printed. That was my uh, confusion. So, Sikha was delivered Simchas Teda Samach a year before the Rebbe was born, Yud Aleph Nisan Samach Beis. And, or half a year actually. And then it was printed in Sefer HaSikha's Tov Shin Beis. Okay. So regarding this topic, a few questions that came in. What does it mean to be a Tomim? So the meaning of a Tomim means complete. There are different explanations given in the Sikhas. Tomim can be complete both in Nigla de Teda, Primia Satera, like when we say Yeshev Eholim, that Yaakov was Ish Tom, Yeshev Eholim. Tom is a short version of Tomim, complete. It has other meanings as well. And Yeshev Eholim, two Eholim, two tents, the tent of Nigla de Teda and Primia Satera. That's one way. Tomim also means in Avedis Hashem, a certain innocence, a certain seamlessness, a lack of dissonance. As the Rebbe told Herbert Weiner, the author of Nine and a Half Mystics, that there's a lack of dissonance, not naivete as he suggested. They don't have two worlds. So Tom is a seamless connection to godliness, to teda, to mitzvahs, to chesidus. And Tomim also ultimately means complete, that what you know is what you do. 
that your actions are aligned with your ideas. And it's not just theories. What you see is what you get. The inside and the outside are all tamim, seamlessly one flow, one entity. Another question was asked regarding what is a tom, another question. What was the difference, what was different about the curriculum in this yeshiva? What was different and unique about the curriculum in this yeshiva? So the first most important thing was the learning of chassidus. Because primi satera da'asa lekeya vicha v'avdua belev of shalom. Also, lev of shalom is also like the word tomim. So when you're learning about godliness, it directly connects you, like the Rambam says, Kesed Yove. Eich Yove. How does a person come to love and awe of God? By contemplating on godly, on the greatness of godliness. So that can be through contemplating in nature, or it can be even more so, like he says in Agar HaSakedish, in Kuntasach, Mitzvah Roman is Gova Me'e, the great mitzvah, learning about God, understanding Dasa Lekei, to learn God, V'yadaita Yeim, to learn what is God like. Chassidus Tachter Chassidus teaches, say the Shtalshlus, the way God works, God's behavior, God's methods, techniques. So then, Mahu Chanan, Afat Chanan, as you learn about God, we learn to emulate God, which is all of Chassidus is to create from a human being a godly human being. There's a pisgim that says that Kabbalah took godliness that's beyond human and turned it into a Tzalem Alekim, into a divine image structure of, of Adam Elyon. Exodus came and took the Adam and turned it into something godly. And then in addition to that curriculum, also Avedis had and as I mentioned, the whole purpose of the yeshiva was to train soldiers, spiritual soldiers, to take Yiddishkeit and turn it into their main preoccupation of bringing godliness to this world. Who coined the phrase, and what is the meaning of if someone ate the kasha and temchit mimim, they will always be a tomim. Well, that expression has different variations. Someone ate the kasha and temchit mimim, they'll always, it will always preserve them, will always save them. So the expression actually that you find the first time that uh, maybe more research needs to be done is in a sikha, in uh, Friedrich Rebbe sikha, it's in Sefer HaSikha's Tofresh, Pay Tofresh Pei Zayin, it's a sikha from Simchas Teda Tofresh Pei Dalar, I believe. So he says, page 58. So he says that the expression, as a chsidish shtikl bread vetnit farfal. A chsidish piece of bread does not get lost. And he talks about different variations. It's, uh, it's also brought in the Rebbe's letters in Igor's Kedish. You can look there, there are all the footnotes. Later on, uh, in the sikha that I mentioned before, which is, I'm sorry, that sikha is Yutas Kislev Tafresh Pedal. Correction, Yutas Kislev there. Simcha Steda Tafresh Pevov, the Rebbe, the Rebbe Friedrich Rebbe also talks about it. That you shouldn't be worried about Gashmias, he says. Only about what you have to do, we'll take care of the Gashmias. But then he says these words. That the Rebbe, the, meaning the Alter Rebbe said, Divus is a chaltna from Kliamke, which means the door handle, the doorknob, of his doorknob, they will not die without shuva. So the Friedrich Rebbe says, the Rebbe, the Tatot Gizokt, Dervus and Kiges, and Achsidish and Shtikl Breit, someone who ate a Chsidic piece of bread, with us, Shlach Lachmuch, Alpnea Maim, then when we designed the Snit Negeye, when that, so they too will always. Be, it'll always serve them. That ultimately, whatever happens, they will return and they will dance in Chesteda. That's what the Rebbe, Safidik Rebbe says there. So there are quite a few sources. The meaning is that when once you ate kasha even, a little uh, porridge or bread, in Bim, something was instilled within you that will never disappear, that will always be there to serve you well. I, some people do wander their own bizarre journeys and ups and downs, but still something will always remain there intact. It's like Kedusha Le'ezazim came a holiness that never wavers. And it will serve a person well. So that expression has been used in many chsidim, many chsidim, and so on. 
<clears throat> you say, how do you know for sure? Well, it's like all Kedusha, especially Kedusha, once Chassidus gets into somebody's bones, not, <laughs> it will always be there in a good way. Is there a source that the Rebbe Rashab looked into the future and handpicked all the souls that would be students in the yeshiva? I have not found it printed. I've heard some people say that Rebbe mentioned it in Fabrengens. I have not found it. If anybody has a source, please share it, and I will share it next week in the next program. But there is such an expression which only goes to emphasize how important it was to Emchit Mimim and the soldiers it would produce, the students it would produce, the leaders and the pioneers that it would produce. Okay. So that covers at least some questions about Tezvovel. Let's now move to Pasha Kisove. Pasha Kisove has many different themes. This is Moshe speaking to the Jewish people. This is the last days of his life. So one of the things that Rebbe quotes a lot, and so based on and, and a Gemara is based on it, that it says this since it was the forty years since they had left Egypt. So Moshe says that Adayim until this day Lo they did not have a Lev Ladas Ayin Lides that they did not reach a level of maturity, and the Gemara based on that says that till forty years a person doesn't really fully understand the deeper intention of his teacher's teachings. This is based on a posik in Kisove. So the 40th year, they should have a certain deeper appreciation, a new quality of understanding and appreciation. They never quoted this, I remember, Yutshva Tov Shinun, Pasha Kisove Tov Shinun. 40 years, that was then, from Tov Shin Yud. And there's a bunch of sikhs on this topic. Yud based Thomas Tovshin Chav Zayin that I've also spoke about it because it was 40 years from when the Friedrich Rebbe was released from prison, Yud based Thomas. And the Rebbe makes it very clear that 40 years is, there are a lot of people who were born during that, during, during that time. They were not all here 40 years ago when they left Egypt. People had children. But since there's someone that was there, they can share with you the experience of what, what the mature experience that 40, years, uh, that 40 years produces. And among other things, and beautiful sikhs on this topic, one person asks here, if only after 40 years the people reach the level of having a heart to know, eyes to see, and ears to hear, as Naim Lishmoy, yeah, uh, I said before only two of them, I said Lev Ladas, and I Naim Lidas, and as Naim Lishmoy, how were they able to say Nasev and Ishma and reach high levels of revelations before that? Well, look, a good student can learn a lot from his teacher even before 40 years old. There are actually two opinions whether 40 years means when you turn 40 or 40 years when you're a 40 years student of that particular teacher. The Rebbe, bring, the Rebbe brings that all on the sikhs I mentioned. So, so then what Moshe is saying that, of course they did. They, they, they received the Torah. They were on very many high levels. They're there. And yet now there's a new dimension. There's always growth. And now when you reach the 40 years, there's a new appreciation that leads us to be able to go into a new dimension of our experiences with godliness. Okay. Let's just pull up the full question here. Another question about the Parsha is this Parsha sadly also has the Teichacha, the rebuke. So there are really two Parshas that talk about rebuke, Bechukaisai, which has 49 Klolis, what we call curses, and Kisove twice that many, 98. And when the Teichacha is read, we know that we don't call up anyway to the Torah, the Balkair himself gets the Aliyah, and it's read in, muted, in a muted tone, because they're very negative. But yet we also know the story, famous story, that the Mitla Rebbe one year, when he heard this Pasha Kisove, he fainted when he heard these curses. They asked him, why did you faint? Every year this Pasha is read. He says, my, when my father, who was the Balkeda, the Alta Rebbe, that year he wasn't there. He says, when my father reads, I only hear blessings. So that means the curses really have deeper blessings. But on the surface level, they have very negative connotations. So someone asked the question as follows. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, I wish you and all your viewers a happy, healthy, sweet, and successful New Year. 
I have a question. There are two parts in the Torah where we read Toichecha, but there's a difference. After the Toichecha of Parsha B'chukosai, Hashem reminds us they took us out of Egypt and promises He will remember the covenants of our forefathers and protect us. But the Toichecha of Kisave ends with more threats that we will go back to Egypt on slave ships. Why is there no consistency between these two messages and why is the Toichecha of Kisave seemingly worse because it doesn't end with words of consolation? Very good question. There are different answers given. One answer that I've heard is that the first Teichach HaBechukaisa is primarily about the first Beis Amigdash, the Beis Amigdash, which was the Churm Beis Amigdash, but it was designated only for 70 years, the Golas. Then they rebuilt the Beis Amigdash. The second Beis Amigdash, the Golas is still dragging on over on close to 2,000 years, where we don't know when the end will be. But there will be an end. So in Parsha B'chukaisai, talking about, we'll call a lesser curse, so to speak. There's an end, there's a clear end, 70 years. So therefore, the curses end with blessings. Parsha Kisavi also ends with blessings, but next Parsha, in its Sovim, we read, we read that there will be an end to all these exiles and all these challenges and all these negative things. Why is it the next Parsha? Because this one is a much more extended one. On the other hand, this extension allows us to do more Aveda and will bring Mashiach, that will be the Bayesh Shlishi, that will be permanent and never destroyed ever again. It's one of the explanations given between the two. In a more primistic way, there are challenges in life where there are challenges, but you can see the end, the light at the end of the tunnel. Then there are times that challenges, you don't really see it. So you don't see the positive immediately, but you know for sure that will happen. So it's in the next chapter. So in life, we have to remember that no matter what challenges, there will be the end of the story and it will be a good ending and a permanently good ending. Teva Nireva Nigla and only reveal good blessings and, and in every part of our lives, life, health, children, and everything that comes with that. Okay. Since next Shabbos, Mitzvah Shabbos is also the beginning of Slichas. So let me just address one thing. When we say machnise rachemim, hachnisu rachemenu, in slichus, whom are we addressing and what are we asking to be done? To take the question even further, just... Machnise Rachemim, help, someone writes. Rabbi Jacobson, I'm feeling increasing anxiety as the time of Slichus approaches, and I'll have to say the prayer, Machnise Rachemim, in which we apparently ask the angels to bring our prayer, prayers up to Hashem. I have two concerns with this. One, how can we make a request to angels in the middle of davening to Hashem? I believe we should daven only to God and to no one else. Two, why do we even need angels to transmit our prayers? If someone says Lashon Hari doesn't need an angel, and Hashem hears it directly. So why would we need an intermediary to transmit our prayers? I've read that this is a controversial topic, and the Alter Rebbe has placed the text in our, this text in our Siddur. What should I think while we're saying these words? I would greatly appreciate your guidance. So actually, I addressed this at length in episode 278. And just briefly, just to sum it up, but look there for more details, there are a number of authorities that have been opposed to this to this recitation, to this statement, and arguing that it's forbidden to address and pray anyone but Hashem, even angels. And they quote actually Rishalmi in Brachas 9.1, Tess Aleph, that if troubles come upon a person, do not entreat the angel Michal or the angel Gabriel, rather entreat me alone, God alone, and I will help you immediately. In the Maral, in the Siva Salem, actually amends and says, and he amends it to be a different type of expression. The Chsam Sefer says to omit it altogether. Nevertheless, most authorities do justify it, and they explain that, it's a, it's, it's, that the prohibition is to appeal to an intermediary and rely on them. But if you're only soliciting their support, as in the case of then it's permitted. So more details, please go to episode 280, 278, where I discuss it more in details. But you should definitely not be concerned. 
A slichus is a gift to us, the opportunity to reach God and to speak to Him, especially as we prepare for the high holidays, starting with Rosh Hashanah. Okay. We have limited time, so let me just talk about someone mentions completely unrelated 30 years since the Crown Heights riots. Dear Rabbi, on August 19th was the 30th anniversary of the riots in Crown Heights. I remember after the tragedy when Mrs., where Mrs. Lapine was murdered, the Rebbe made some impassioned public comments about it. It almost seemed as if he took it very personal as it happened in his community. My question is, do you remember the Rebbe making, if the Rebbe made any public remarks about the riots? Well, we all know the remarks the Rebbe made to Mayor Dinkins, who came for dollars and asked for peace between the blacks and the Jews or the blacks and the whites and the, Rebbe, to the, two, the two peoples. And the Rebbe said, one people under one administration under one God. I don't recall public statements in the Fabrengans then. I think privately the Rebbe did comment. I did hear when the Rebbe was asked for a statement and he didn't give one, so the, the, the secretaries of the Rebbe said that people are wondering why the Rebbe is not commenting something that happened in his own community and actually started with the entourage of the Rebbe, not by anyone's fault. An accident, Gavin Cato was killed, but then they killed Yankel Rosenbaum in cold blood. So the Rebbe said, because he, he just lives here, so as we go, if something happens in Washington, D.C., you don't ask the president of the United States for a statement. You ask the mayor of the, si- of the, town, of the city. That's what I heard at the time. I never confirmed it. But that didn't mean the Rebbe did not care. Obviously, he cared. But the Rebbe did not want to directly perhaps comment on especially a lot of politics involved and a lot of other stuff. So uh, the good news is that after that, Crown Heights began to grow and thrive. And look what we have today. But that's, uh, what, that's what I recall from that period in time. Um, but I will just say that I did use that story in Torah Meaning for Life, and it's come to use many times, because the Rebbe's statement is, is unbelievable. Because the Rebbe is saying, he didn't come and start saying, protect the Jews and forget about the blacks. It was that all people, if they live up to the divine image, would never behave this way. That was the bottom line. The Rebbe didn't say those words, but that was, uh, that's clearly implicit. So there's many lessons to be learned in that, and there's much more to talk about, but we'll stop with that. Okay. Now, someone writes, if you read the word dibuk backwards in Hebrew, it says COVID. Okay. Is it possible that in ancient times when someone was said to be possessed by a dibuk, dibuk meant something attached, talked about demons, a negative energy attached itself to someone. So this person is writing, is it possible that in ancient times when someone was said to be possessed by a dibuk, they were really suffering from an infection, but medical science at the time didn't know it? I mean, everything is possible. You know, every physical disease evolves from spiritual diseases. We know Mitzayda, for example, was always a spiritual disease. It was never the actual leprosy that we know of today. So... I don't like to speculate about these things, to say that COVID today is a form of dibuk or vice versa. I will just say that negative energies are negative energies and whatever you, whatever you call it, our role is to repel it by adding in kedusha and holiness in connection in everything that this period in time has allowed us to dig deeper into our souls, become more connected, stronger than ever before. And they just finally end this whole epidemic and pandemic and we can just march and use this as a springboard because it clearly is a wake-up call and a lesson to the Gula Mitis Vashlem. Okay. Now there are more questions. Let me deal with, uh, let me just see here. I must tell you that questions keep coming in at a, a pace that I can't keep up with. It's just impossible to cover them all in an hour or an hour and a few minutes every week, but I assure you, and I give you my word, that I will continue to plow through them and we will address them all. Okay. Some questions I'm going to push off for next week, simply because time limitations. I will now address the follow-up. and the Chassidus question. So follow-up, or two follow-ups. One, I spoke last week about the husband's power to give a get. Hi, Rabbi Jacobson. I'm in the middle of listening to your My Life class where you are addressing why the Torah gave the power to the man to give a get, a divorce, 
And you are saying that the fact that people can abuse this law is not a question on the Torah, because the Torah expects people to be decent, and that when people behave in the wrong way, due to their free will. I cannot comprehend what you mean. The very basis of good law is that it protects man from those who will try to pry and violate him. It is bad law that doesn't cover it is bad law that doesn't cover and doesn't take into account that by definition there will be abusers in the system. That is exactly why good law is necessary and we don't suffice with the general exhortation to be a decent person. The divorce laws in the Torah actually give bad people more power. In the 80s there was an orthodox man who made his minor daughter and wife an aguna by declaring that he had accepted kedushin for his daughter and he would, wouldn't say from whom unless his demands were met. Again, for the decent people, for the decent person, very few laws are necessary. It's exactly because there are criminals and abusive instincts that law is necessary. Bad laws leave loopholes that abusers can abuse. That, then it's evil law. That actually gives abusers more power over the victims, even if the majority of people are not abusers, and even if the lawgiver is hoping there will be no abusers. How can I believe that God created anything less than perfect law? I'm so looking forward to your response. Thank you. Look, we all share the indignation and anger and, and, uh, and sheer, uh, sheer outrage at anyone using Torah, especially the laws of Gitten, to hurt any person. And for that matter, anyone that uses Torah like a maneuver, like a despicable person. But at the same time, the Torah, yes, of course, it, has, it, it puts very clear guidelines what it means, what is, what's expected of people. But we cannot deny that some people simply do not listen. They don't listen to Rabbanim. They don't listen to Abezdin. So what do you do then? You're asking, why does the Torah not give us a guarantee, airtight thing to, to deal with corrupt, abusive, criminal people? The answer is the Torah has its approach and it has its punishments and its de- deterrence as well. Not everything can be enforced today. That's why good Rabbonim are going to look at the Torah and look at what can be done to protect innocent people. I didn't say we shouldn't do that. I was just saying the fact that the Torah has a reason that gives the man a certain power, just like it gives a woman a certain power, not in this area, in other areas, that should not be criticized, that you don't go change the Torah. The Torah has very good reason why different people have different roles in a relationship, in a marriage. Why Kedushin marriage is done a certain way, divorce is done a certain way, like anything. Why a Koyin brings an offering in the base of Middash and not a Yisrael. Either Koyin can be corrupt, so the Torah addresses that as well. I was saying you don't go change the Torah, you go and take the Torah and use the Torah guidelines, and that's what good Rabbanim have to do to make sure it shouldn't be abused. That's also part of Torah. So this wasn't a justification that anyone could do whatever they want. It was saying that the Torah is the Torah, the Torah also now expects us to live up to it, and if not, that the leaders in our bottom of a community should try to do something about it. Are they doing something? That can be debated. Some say they are, some say they're not. Some say that they should do a lot more. Clearly they have to do a lot more. And we're not talking about breaking Torah or changing. In other words, is the solution that we no longer give the man the power of a get? Let's say someone argues that. Let's say you give it to the woman. Now let's say the woman abuses it, then what do you do? In other words, we're not here to change the law. We have to understand the law, understand its reasoning, and also deal with situations where a person abuses it. That was the main focus of my discussion on this topic. Another question, follow-up. Hi, Rabbi Jacobson. Following up on the question that you discussed last week about Mamzerim, you said that you didn't think it would be a good idea to create a dating app for Mamzerim. Why not? Wouldn't that be a good way to ensure that mamzers marry one another rather than non mamzers I ask genuinely as a shatchan who cares about their plight. Thank you. Look, I also care about their plight. And I think it would be much wiser and more respectful if it's done with discretion. To go make an app, a public app, that people know about may be very embarrassing and humiliating. That was my main point. If someone can find a way to create shidduchim in a discreet way that does not bring anyone else into the picture, you know, I'm not here, I'm not the, 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 the decider when you make an app or don't make an app. If it serves a need and it's done with discretion and respect, then go ahead and do it the right way. But it's very vital to protect the, the confidence and the dignity of every human being, 
especially people who have been, unfortunately, for whatever reason, close to have to deal with such challenges. Okay. One final question, flood damage. Due to the fact there's a hurricane and flood, is flood damage from a big storm or hurricane something bad in itself? Or is that, or is the bad from a lack of, of lack of good? Let me just, re, let me reread that. It's not written. Let me correct that. Is flood damage from a big storm or hurricane bad in of itself and of itself? Or is the bad due to too much chesed and lack of gvura? That was too much rain. Well, it doesn't matter. Even if it's a flood due to too much chesed without gvura, that's still not considered a blessing. A blessing is that the rain should come in a, in a, in a regulated way, drop by drop, to be absorbed in the earth. So no matter how you twist it, it's not a positive thing. Or the other way around, even negative things we all know have a positive element to them. The key thing to remember that any type of flood, the Rebbe says, not just a fire, that mepik alien. after a fire we become wealthy, the Rebbe also said you can apply the same thing to other tragedies like a flood or other things that cause damage. So that should be the main lesson that all of it should lead to chesed, a good chesed, and a blessed year. Let me then conclude now with a question, question. Hi, Rabbi Jacobson. I have been a viewer and huge fan of your program from the very beginning. Thank you so much for all that you have done for me and for all the other viewers. In the last two episodes, you have been dealing with the question of whether or not we exist. And I discussed it that Peter, God said we exist and therefore created existence and we discussed it at length. The question that I have are, is, are the questions I have are, why do we exist? Why would Hashem, who doesn't need or want anything, create humans and angels? Hashem can't get lonely, and Hashem can achieve anything, so why would He need us for any purpose whatsoever? It would seem logical that Hashem would never create any being because He can accomplish anything on His own. Why do we exist? And the answer is brought in Tanya Perek Lamedvov, the ultimate answer, Nesava Kaddish Baruch Hu Lies Leis Baruch Dira V'Tachtein. God desired... And the Alter Rebbe explains that this is God's desire and you can't ask a question because the whole concept of questions and answers and logic is a result of Nisava. What's not there prior to that because God is not bound by loans of logic. More, more in detail, when you look in the beginning of Hemshech Samachvov, Tofre Samachvov, the Hemshech of also Rosh Hashanah Tovshin Beis, the Lukut Sikh Shmois, Chelik Vov, Volume 6, the second Sikh and Shmois, cites different reasons given in Sfarim on why God created the world. One is to reveal his potential capacity, all his potential. Another is that, we, that, that his goodness, in order to do goodness to the creation. Another is that there should be someone that recognizes his greatness. Begin the Ishtamudin Bey in order that he should be known. But ultimately, Chassidus says, all those answers are not complete answers because God doesn't need any of that. So those answers are legitimate in different levels of Seder Ishtalshlis. The, the, the ultimate purpose is because of the, 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 the and that I just cited, he makes it clear that does not add anything to God. It's just what God wants and that's what he did. So, that's what we need to wrap our heads around and understand that the reason we exist is because God shows that we exist and that there's no deeper, there's nothing greater that you can answer than that. And that choice, that desire, doesn't have a question. Now, it does make sense afterwards because you realize that even in an existence like ours, tachtenim, you can also recognize God. But that's not why God did it because God doesn't gain anything from that as he explains in those sikhs. So as we prepare for Rosh Hashanah, which is Zayim Tchilas Masachah, the beginning of creation, renewal of creation, we have to recognize, we don't ask why. That's what it says in Sama Marim. We don't know why, Lama Nisava, but we know what he wants. So we don't ask why, we ask what. What do you want? He wants us to transform this world into a, a godly world, into a divine home, which will happen in a complete way, in which we are now in the threshold. And that's how we have to focus on. So everyone have a ksiva ksimateva. We continue this journey. My life is supplied. This has been episode 368. Every Sunday, 8 to 9 p.m. 
Everyone have a chsivr chsimateva, good geben, shtiar, beteva, nidava, nigla. And I look forward to see you next week. Call Tuv and be well. This program is brought to you by My Life, Chasidis Applied. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at chasidisapplied.com slash donate.